Just need to start. There we go. Start the recording. Get the PowerPoint slide up. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Adam Jones. Um, I am the Director of Operations with Sustainable Buildings Canada. And um, if you've been on our webinars before, then uh, you know part of my role is um, to find interesting topics uh, that maybe we have uh, we need more knowledge on. And so today we have uh, reached out to the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials, otherwise known as IAPMO, to talk about um, some of the really interesting work that they've been doing about, around water efficiency. So one of the things that uh, we at Sustainable Buildings Canada have noticed is that in Canada, we there's not a lot of water efficiency standards. There's not a lot of specifics about how to best design water um, efficient processes. And most of that is just developed around um, either municipal requirements or around uh, just mechanical efficiency. So uh, the mechanical engineers sort of get that tossed on them. And then uh, more recently, we're starting to see um, the manufacturers of final use, like the faucet we're looking at here, eventually really are determining how water efficient a building is. So as we get these higher efficiency water systems in our higher efficiency buildings, how can we change the way that we uh, determine how much water we need? So IAPMO has done some incredible work on the water efficiency standard and the water um, demand calculator, which has recently been adopted in Vancouver. Um, it was, I understand it's been used since about 2017 in Vancouver as part of their rainwater and gray water use, but it has been recently adopted as part of the potable water um, calculations. And this is really, really making a, a big moves in Vancouver about water efficiency. And so it's the sort of thing that uh, we're hoping is of interest uh, to our broader community. So we have um, uh, Christoph here. I will introduce Christoph in a, in a moment. I just want to give a quick rundown of our timeline today. We're starting here, uh, one o'clock our time, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, just a short introduction from me, and then we'll hand things over to the IAPMO team with Christoph and Hugo. Um, we're not sure if Hugo's um, able to join us, but if he shows up, he will be part of this. Um, and so they're going to walk us through the water domain calculator and the water efficiency standard, also called We Stand. So just a few notes from the Sustainable Buildings Canada side. Um, we have always lots of research being done for new construction. Um, we post these all on our website at sbcanada.org slash papers. Um, and so keep an eye out there. There's always new work being done. And then also for existing buildings, that one's under sbcanada.org slash resources. If you go to our website, you'll be able to find all we can, um, all, all we have produced. And also if you're interested in doing research or you're working on research right now that you would like to share to a broader audience, um, please um, send us an email or reach out through the website and give us an idea of what you're working on and how we can help. We have another upcoming webinar um, next month, November 19th, where we will be hearing a presentation from Stanley Francis Bailey, um, who has done some research. The white paper that we've supported is called Evaluating Energy Sprung Retrofrits for Solid Masonry Townhomes in Toronto. So this is a pilot study based on the energy sprung or energy sprung process, which is an, a sort of an industrial approach to overcladding um, existing housing to try to drive down the cost of retrofit, particularly for affordable and community housing. Um, and so he did a hydrothermal performance um, test um, to determine what was the best way to do this with brick buildings. Anyone who has worked with brick buildings uh, retrofits knows that the way they're designed makes some of these overcladding processes a challenge. So he's dug into that a little bit. And then um, another organization that we have uh, reached out to that we work with, uh, many of the individuals sort of share interests with Sustainable Buildings Canada um, is Passive Buildings Canada. So they are going to give us a presentation about what their organization does and um, how you can be a part of it. They do a lot of what they call 
boots on the ground events or bog events where they bring people together to um, either work on a specific project or go through research that is interrelated um, and then lots of networking as well. So we'll hear from those two together on November 19th. And if you just go to our website, that'll be listed there under events. And if you are signed up to our um, newsletter, you'll receive, uh, you should receive um, a link through the newsletter at some point. All right, so follow up after this. As always, um, everything that we do at Sustainable Buildings Canada is all about knowledge mobilization. Our goal is to find interesting um, topics within sustainability, within the built environment, and, and share them with as many people as we can. So um, anyone who's registered for the workshop or for the webinar today will receive the slide deck and a link to the recording and contact info for our presenters. And then as always, we post the recordings on our YouTube channel. So if you, I don't have the link here, but if you go to, um, uh, I think it's, uh, we might be SB, SB Canada on YouTube, but if you search Sustainable Buildings, on, Sustainable Buildings Canada on YouTube, you'll find us there. All right. With that, just a brief introduction. Um, we have Christoph Lohr here from IAPMO, the Vice President of Technical Services and Research. Um, with this incredibly long list of certifications um, after his name, um, I appreciate, uh, Christoph, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and talk about this. Um, as we briefly discussed before we got on, most of IAPMO's work is sort of in the US realm, but um, the great thing about energy efficiency and water efficiency is that it works anywhere. And so we're really, really happy um, and thankful you're willing to take the time to talk to us today. Excellent, thank you, Adam. And and Hugo sends his regards. Unfortunately, he was not able to, to make it today. Um, had something else that just came up, but I just wanna say thank you so much. I know you said thank you for taking time on my schedule. However, I'm just so thankful to you all for allowing me the opportunity uh, to talk about this really important subject of, of really water safety and water sustainability and, and that nexus there and how we stand in the water demand calculator fits into that. Um, you know, and, and as Adam mentioned, you know, I do have a rather long list of credentials after my name. Uh, I guess a short story on that. Um, part of what I felt um, as I was preparing for my PE exam um, to get my professional engineering licensure in Arizona, uh, in the US, I should say, uh, I'm licensed in Arizona and a number of other states at this point, was that the, the examination didn't really include much on water. Um, and by that point, I was already kind of on this track to, to focusing my efforts as a mechanical engineer on plumbing systems as opposed to HVAC. And as a result of that, I, I really felt it was important to start getting a more well-rounded look at, at plumbing systems. And so uh, I got my lead AP BD plus C first, uh, got my certified plumbing design from ASPE. And then recently, uh, because of some of the concerns of waterborne pathogens, I also got my, my uh, ASSC 12,080 Legionella Risk Mitigation Specialist. And, and where I, as I was talking to Adam here before the presentation, that's really where I like to operate is in that, that nexus at that connecting point in water between the sustainability side and the safety side uh, and making sure that, that we're really looking at those systems holistically. Um, and so that's really was kind of the, the, the emphasis of what I was going to present today. So I'm hopeful that, um, you know, for all of our live listeners and then for all of you that are watching via recording, um, you know, would love to have a dialogue with you, uh, you know, by feel free to, to message me on, on LinkedIn or, or via email uh, and, and just open up a dialogue and, and really, you know, would love to get feedback in terms of what you all think in terms of the safe, the sustainability and safety nexus. So with that, uh, you know, the agenda today is I want to give a, a quick overview after that really great introduction by Adam. Thank you. Really appreciate the kind words. We're gonna. I just want to spend a quick moment on the water safety and sustainability that nexus and, and what it means. We're gonna spend a little bit of time then on, on the we stand. That's the water efficiency and sanitation standard. Uh, specifically, I'm gonna look at mostly the 2023, which was just released in July of this year. And then I within we stand and also in the Uniform Plumbing Code, we're gonna to touch on the water demand calculator and and just spend a little bit of time there in terms of what it is, what are the benefits, and and how to utilize it. Uh, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. So with that, you know, really want to start with, with a quote that I think really sets the stage well here for, for our conversation and discussion here today. 
This one's by David LaFrance, CEO of the American Water Works Association, where he says, people think that water is simple, but it is highly complicated. And this is something that I've noticed in my career as well, where at a lot of the engineering firms I worked for, uh, there was this line that people thought plumbing was easy. And I think we, we've we really taken for granted that the science behind plumbing is actually quite complex. And we've really tried to simplify it uh, via rules of thumb. Now, rules of thumb based on physics are a great way to create efficiencies in design and construction. However, we've gone back many times and adjusted some of the base assumptions without realizing it as we've worked through the last you know, 80, 90, 100 years in terms of the science behind plumbing. And so at this point, we really have to go back and take a look at some of the basic assumptions. If we don't take a basic look at this, what can happen is we end up with friction points and, and points where it seems as if some of the goals behind water are not possible because things are pushed up against each other. For example, water conservation um, oftentimes recently has seemingly been at odds with public health and safety. Early in my career as an engineer, uh, that lead had come out and, and you know many, many cred uh, professionals, including myself, got the lead AP credential as part of an effort to, to promote energy efficiency in buildings. However, as we fast forwarded, um, we found that some of the things that 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 energy efficiency and, and, and sustainable design pushed for could cause public health and safety issues. One of the most notable is the use of fixtures lower than legal limit, uh, often referred to as low flow fixtures. What has happened in essence is we decided to lower the flow rates of, of, of the various plumbing fixtures without ever going back and evaluating how we size the pipes serving them. We are still using old methodologies and, and more on that later in my presentation. What that led to was in the 2019 NASM, that's the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering of Medicine, uh, they released a, a document called the Management of Legionella Water Systems. Uh, then the American Society of Plumbing Engineers had a follow-up document that was released in 2023 that also mentioned it. Both documents have this line that says low flow fixtures should not be allowed in hospitals and long-term care facilities because they present a greater risk for Legionella development and plumbing systems that feed them due to the increase in water age. The, if you have the same pipe and you reduce the flow rate, that water in the pipe will sit there longer. And all disinfectants out there, uh, especially oxidizing disinfectants, they dissipate over time. Chlorine, for instance, dissipates in about 24 hours. Chloramine dissipates in about a week, pending water quality, other water quality parameters. So we need to be really mindful when we're doing any kind of action, especially in regards to water, that when we pull on one lever that we're not accidentally pulling on three others that could have unintended consequences. And this idea of unintended consequences is something that's really important. One of my favorite blogs out there, Farnham Street, and if you're not um, a subscriber, uh, they have a free newsletter, I, I would highly recommend it. Um, they had an article that came out that talked about unintended consequences. And, and that image in the bottom left corner there, if I can get my laser pointer, points on that. If you have a problem and you have two solutions, and at first glance, solution A is better than B, so that's why it's green, many of us will just go with solution A. What we really have to train ourselves as, as engineers, as, as a public, as society is, okay, perhaps solution set A looks better right off the bat, but what's the ripple effect? What's the second order uh, consequence of that action? You know, What's the consequence of the consequence or the third order effect? And when we start evaluating based on that second and third order effect, we often might find that the, the consequence of that action, whether it's good or bad, could change our answer, which solution set is better. This is why IATMO, we came up with this framework that's called plumbing resiliency. Uh, really, and oftentimes you could kind of fit water resiliency in there as well. Typically when we talk about the built environment, we're thinking in terms of, okay, what can survive an earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado? But when we start talking about water, yes, we have to have that in mind. Seismic bracing for you know water heaters is important, for instance. But we also have to think about the slow-moving disasters, such as drought. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. We just had another sixty, uh, another twenty percent on top of a sixty percent reduction in our allotment of Colorado River water. So we have, drought is a very real thing, and about seventy percent of the U.S. is going to experience water shortages over the the coming years. Uh, that was a study that was recently done. We also have to worry about 
the safety, the public health and safety aspect of water. As mentioned before, water age and these topics of waterborne pathogens and things like PFAS in our water, that has to be concerned. And finally, all human beings need access to water. We can only survive about three days without water. And so keeping in mind affordability and equity of water systems to make sure that we're not gold plating a system to the point that, that nobody can afford it is also vital. So we have these various variables that we really need to be considering almost at the same time. And that's where building codes and stretch codes like we stand become very important because they help us address some of these things holistically. So with that, we're gonna spend a, the next little bit on we stand and talking about a few of the different items in there, including the water demand calculator, which will be sort of a subset. So for source, uh, for your source here, if you want to scan the QR codes, and I'll, I'll leave these up uh, for just a moment here while I talk, um, or if you want to take a screenshot, and, and Adam, I'm more than happy to share this uh, a PDF of this presentation with you and your with your um, with your listeners and and the people on the recording. Again, this is a great way to get access to it. That top QR code and and web page that is um, to the free viewer. All of IATMOS codes and standards are available for free viewing online with the internet access. If you want to purchase an offline version, uh, whether it's a hard copy or, or in this case, I, I shared the ebook because I think many people uh, probably prefer the ebooks. I know I do in many cases. That is the link if you want to go ahead and purchase it. So, but that's the link to the new 2023 We Stand in case anybody wants to follow along that way. So I'll just take a moment here, take a drink of water and then we'll continue on. All right, so first off, as we discuss We Stand, and We Stand is short for the Water Efficiency and Sanitation Standard for the Built Environment. Uh, this is an IAPMO ANSI uh, accredited, um, it follows the ANSI uh, process for uh, its creation, and first came out in 2017. There's also a 2020 version. And worth noting within both of the, within the We Stand document is particularly the scope. And this is what I really wanted to point to because it really hits home on what I was discussing before about that holistic approach. So the, the purpose of the standard, I should say, is to provide minimum requirements to optimize water use practices attributed to the built environment. So there's that water sustainability component while maintaining protection of the public health, safety, and welfare. So right off bat, what really sets We Stand apart from other, other standards and codes out there, and really it, it's developed as a, as a stretch code for adoption for jurisdictions to start pushing the envelope a bit in terms of water sustainability, is to not have a negative impact on public health and safety. And that's really worth noting because right off bat, that sets the stage for some of the next pro um, provisions that are in the 2023 We Stand that are certainly good ones. Uh, for consideration. First off, we'll just touch on water metering. Uh, this is becoming more and more important. Um, and so there's a whole table, uh, and I know it's small print. Again, if you find, um, can, um, if you have the, the ebook version or the, the online viewer, you can, you can go to that chapter four. Uh, it's right next to this, this provision in 411.0. This 411.1.1 meter performance specifications. Consumption data shall be capable of being reported to within 0.35 cubic feet resolution at each 15 minute interval. Flow data, flow rate data shall be capable of being reported at each 0.25 gallon per minute change in flow rate. This is in large part actually due, um, it's a, what, what proves this out is the, in large part the work we're doing at IATMO in terms of the water demand calculator and estimating peak flow rates in buildings. When you actually look at the peak flow rates in buildings, what you'll see is more often than not, um, and we actually, and I'll show the slide later on, most of the time, the building is going to be at the low level. That peak flow rate that we calculate everything for happens a very, very small percentage of the time, if at all. And so it's really important that when you when we're sizing a meter, that the meters are right sized. And this provision really helps with that. Um, if you look at most meters out there, especially turbine and disc meters, the larger the meter you get, the higher the minimum flow rate, which means if you're bouncing along the bottom or if you only have one lavatory at you know somewhere in the range of a, a, a quarter to half a gallon per minute, uh, you, you might miss that flow rate, which means that's lost revenue for the jurisdiction, but it also means that you're not really accounting what's going on in the building. So it's really, really important that meters are quote unquote right size. And we'll touch on that a bit more with the water demand calculator as well. But right off the bat, 
having the proper monitoring of, of, of systems is important. This also is part of some other pieces in terms of making sure you don't have a leak, but more on that later. A new provision that was added in 2023 was the hot water ratio. This is a really, a really important provision because what we're talking about here is coordination between the architect and the engineer and really making the water system that much more efficient, specifically the hot water system. So as many of you know, you know, especially in a home, um, the hot water system tends not to be recirculated, although in some cases, especially larger homes, they do. And in certain energy codes are starting to push that. However, the, lar the longer or further away your plumbing fixture, your hot water using plumbing fixture from your, sh like your shower or your kitchen sink is from your water heater, the longer it takes to deliver that hot water, especially if that water's cooled off overnight and you don't have a recirculation pump. Or if your recirculation pump, um, the, the branch from that line to your fixture is longer. What this provision adds is a maximum ratio of the hot water system rectangle to a dwelling unit versus the footprint of the entire dwelling unit shall not exceed 60%. So what does that mean? Well, uh, fortunately, um, uh, our good friend and colleague, Gary Klein, uh, who owns Gary Klein and Associates, um, he has a really good example of this. Um, and so he shared this uh, at one of the uh, American Society of Plumbing Engineers symposiums last year. It's also a good way to reduce water age and, and have some improvements in terms of safety. Um, and that's why it's worth noting. If you look at this original design and you look at the plumbing system and you were to draw a box, again, the water heater ended up being in this closet here where my laser pointer is. The plumbing wet wall in this in this north side uh, bathroom is here. And so literally the water had to stretch there, you know, and it had to go in sort of a square over to that that fixture. Now, you know, you had a kitchen sink over here, a bathroom in the middle, washer dryer in, in this in this area. So and then you had a hose bib on the ex, on the exterior walls. And so it really took a pretty large area. So it, almost 79% of this. 1600 square foot home, a three, a common three bedroom, two bathroom, single story home was being almost 80% of that, of that square footage was being utilized. <clears throat> the next iteration, what they were able to do was to, to add the water heater in this, in this section here and put the washer and dryer in that area. And then they had the two bathrooms back to back. And this kitchen sink now was also on this back wall. So now if you were to draw a box around the entire water usage area, it's only 15% of an even smaller square foot home. So 1,200 square feet uh, total home and only 100, almost 180 plus square feet of that was where the plumbing system had to run. Specifically, again, this is for hot water. Now the next iteration, they tightened it even further. Again, they moved the wet wall over and just shared a single common wall. And so they were able to reduce even further down to 4% as part of this first iteration of this home. Now they continued along and one of amazingly, one of the next revisions, they ended up using an instantaneous gas fired water heater and put it into the, into the same closet as the washer and dryer. And they were able to get down to two and a half percent. So again, this box continues to get smaller and smaller. Finally, a very extreme version. Uh, they got it down to 10 square feet. Uh, so less than a percent of the floor area. But again, highly efficient in terms of the delivery of hot water. Uh, I've just recently presented this at the uh, at a conference of building officials. And one of the building officials there, you know, she shared with me, her home actually had an older home had kind of a similar design where her shower was right on the other side of the wall of her water heater. And she barely has to let her water heater um, you know, shower run. And she's able to step in almost, almost basically instantaneously. So this concept of hot water ratio is one that was included. And not only that, but it really reduces the lengths of the hot water system and makes it much more efficient too. But it also reduces water age, which is, has a net positive effect in terms of water safety. So a really important concept here. Another system in chapter six that was uh, added was urine diversion systems. Um, a good friend and colleague of mine, Mr. John Lansing, who works for PAE, PAE engineers, uh, gave an excellent presentation on urine diversion systems at the Emerging Water Technology Symposium that actually this year took place in Scottsdale, Arizona. His presentation touched on what urine diversion systems are. And, and in that presentation, he touched on how um, the toilets are typically designed where um, if, so, uh, if the user is using it, um, the human waste, uh, the elimination, uh, the solids end up going into the back of the toilet, while the front of the toilet has a design such that as the urine hits the front end of the bowl, 
due to the viscosity, it ends up getting put into a separate trap from the from the the rest of the human waste. And when the flushing occurs, it kind of gets diverted um, to a separate portion uh, to a separate system. This is important because these systems off, offer opportunities for for other uses of the urine. Um, and that's actually um, that building up here is a great example. It's the PAE Living Building Project uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, a really, really interesting project where they, I mean, very high, um, high efficiencies in terms of overall water usage. Uh, I think they barely have any, if, uh, if any at all, water usage in that building. Part of the urine diversion systems that's described is some of the components and the important pieces. I showed you that snippet of the code proposal uh, or the code addition before, but really one of the big things is that the nutrients are used and, and, and concentrated uh, in a safe manner that can be used elsewhere, um, especially for uh, various um, fertilizers and whatnot. This subject, uh, and again, uh, if, if you're interested in learning more, uh, again, I'd be happy to put you in touch with Mr. John Lansing, uh, who would make for an excellent presentation on this. Again, he gave a great one at the Emerging Water Technology Symposium in Scottsdale this year. Moving on in the interest of time, on-site water reuse, uh, which goes by several names, um, you know, potable water reuse, um, uh, water reuse, um, any number of other uh, alternate water sources, we're kind of talking about water reuse as a whole and chapters seven through 11 in we stand all deal with various versions of this uh so chapter seven alternate water sources for non-potable applications chapter eight on-site black water treatment systems chapter nine on-site gray water treatment systems chapter 10 on-site storm water treatment systems and finally chapter 11 non-potable rainwater catchment systems all of these deal with various versions of water reuse of some kind whether it comes from waste or storm um, and, and, and what the safe usage is for each one of them. Um, again, great sections. It, this is one of the, the this, at this time, it's the only building code, again, with WeStand being a stretch code that provides any kind of literature about how to do this safely. Um, my other colleague, another colleague of mine, Dan Cole, uh, who he and I work on the same team together on technical services at Research at IATMO, he created a great paper and presentation for the CIB conference that was held this year, uh, just actually a couple months ago at Northampton, England, where he presented on this. And, and here are some snippets from his presentation. You can see the black water, gray water, and storm water trains and what they could look like. And you'll notice there's some differences as far as what some of the treatment methods are needed there. Um, again, he had a full presentation on this. Um, I'm happy to share the slide. And if you want a copy of his of that CIB report, please reach out and let me know. We'd be happy to get you in touch with Dan uh, and, and get you all a copy of it as well. Uh, but this was really a really well done paper where he, Dan touched on just some of the, the regulations currently, especially in the US, uh, much of it's based off the Blue Ribbon Commission. But one of the important parts of this is, is the continuous monitoring aspect of it. Now, one of the unique pieces in we stand is the use of log logarithmic reduction targets. And, and there's a mention to this I, IATMO IGC 324, which has since morphed into IATMO ANSI standard Z1324, which is includes these this LRT or logarithmic uh, reduction targets um, as part of the standard for alternate water source systems for multifamily residential and commercial use. This this is utilized in we stand this particular product standard. And so again, it's, it's a great one for a point of reference. This could almost be a topic uh, of, of an individual presentation. And again, if you're all are interested, we'd be happy to get you in touch with Dan. He presented on this at the ASSE conference recently uh, and, and just has done a really great job helping explain some of the ins and outs, but an important part of we stand for sure. Another and one of the last pieces before I move on to the water demand calculator components is leak detection. Uh, as mentioned before, you know, especially if water meters are oversized, uh, you know, the, the potential to capture leaks are, are may be missed because leak flow rates are pretty low. But one of the, the provisions that was added to the, to this, to the we stand was the use of leak detection pieces in it uh, and, and standards in it. Um, specifically, IATMO Z1349, which is the new one that came out in uh, 2021, um, but also 115 and 349, which were the IGCs that, that were kind of um, utilized as the C documents and kind of combined into 
I have a Z1349. So those are all mentioned there. And there's some nuances there, but this is something that is most certainly uh, a, a great addition to the inclusion of WeStand because if we can prevent leaks, there's a, a mold protection component to this, but also uh, an improvement in terms of water efficiency. Again, leaking toilets. <laughs> I think there was one study I saw that on the high end that estimated 10,000 gallons of water wasted per year per toilet uh, due to flapper leaks and whatnot. So again, this can be a, a great part of an overall strategy to reducing water usage while also maintaining safety. All right, and without further ado, let's touch on the second half. And the water demand calculator is, is a pretty broad subject. And so when we were preparing for this presentation, we, we felt it was important to break this out from the other ones uh, because it is, it's, it's really a paradigm shift completely within industry. So real quick, as we're talking about this, from we stand 2020 to 2023, one of the biggest changes with the water demand calculator was where it was located in we stand. In the 2017 and 2020 we stand, the water demand calculator was located in Appendix C of the document because it was thought to be a potential improvement uh, and it was so revolutionary um, that uh, in terms of alternate sizing that it, it was more of an opt-in provision. However, um, in the 2023 version, it has gotten moved up to chapter five. Um, it is now in a chapter because in essence, everyone has, uh, industry has started to coalesce and agree on the idea that right sizing, especially due to the water demand calculator, and we'll explain that topic here um, in the next few slides, is a critical part to improving water safety, but also reducing water usage, particularly in hot water systems. And so because that, that paradigm is being more incepted um, and the reduction in, in construction costs, this is where it got moved up. So with that, let's kind of introduce this topic. So with that, you know, the, the question comes up, why is this a, such a paradigm shift? And in many respects, it's because the hunter's curve, which has been used since 1940, that was when it was developed, December of 1940, and has been used by basically most model plumbing codes, both in the US and Canada and, and other countries, was developed by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Roy Hunter with no computer, let alone a calculator. And he had to make a lot of assumptions. Now, the flow rates from 1940 till today have drastically reduced. I think toilets are 70 to 80% of the original flow rates from 1940. However, the bigger problem that really has even more of an impact was that the fixture unit, which is a combination of flow rate and a probability of simultaneous use of other fixtures, had a component in there that, that made the assumption that every plumbing fixture in a home had lines behind it like a sports stadium at halftime. Homes don't work that way. Uh, an apartment complex doesn't work that way. And we have the data now to prove it. And so when we talk about the water demand calculator, it really is a 21st century plumbing and water resilient solution. Um, again, as I mentioned, it is in we stand uh, and has just moved up uh, from, from, chap uh, from Appendix C into chapter five. But it is also worth noting that's included in the 2024 and 2021 and 2018 uniform plumbing codes. Uh, in the Uniform Plumbing Code, it is still located in Appendix M, as in mustache, uh, and it is a free download. It's an Excel-based uh, calculator that has a um, that has a macro in it. So you will need to enable macros. I promise there's no security threat from it uh, if you download it from our webpage, but it is worth noting that it is there. So um, that's the QR code, and that's the, the location of where it is. Um, now, the Appendix M uh, that I show here, that's very similar to chapter five, the, the, the how to use section of it. Uh, and, and really it's, uh, uh, it's so important because the way that the calculator works is it more accurately estimates peak flow rates. Uh, as a quick example, um, well, let me get into this part here. So um, I'll give everybody a second here. I'll take a drink of water if they wanna have that QR code and then we'll move on. All right, so what do I mean by accurately right sizing? So, and 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 the benefits of, of reduced pipe sizes. Well, if you look at the Hunter's curve, and, and this is the Hunter's curve that's in the UPC Appendix A, uh, you, if you look at other model codes, it basically all follows the same line. Keep in mind that the when we size a pipe, we're estimating what the peak flow rate is. Uh, and you know, in terms of engineering, we want to make sure we have a safety factor uh, that 
overestimates the peak flow rate. If, if we end up underestimating the peak flow rate, what can happen is you don't have as much available pressure there due to the pressure losses in the uh, building and, and velocity losses. So typically we wanna see a, a safety factor of some kind, um, you know, within reason, a reasonable safety factor, but we don't wanna oversize. Now, if you look at this particular graph, this came from, from Gary Klein and 2050 Strategic Partners, and they did a study together. And what you'll notice is this red line keeps going up and up and up and up, and you see these black dots. Well, these black dots are observed flow rates, uh, the peak flow rates over a period of, of weeks to months of a modern multi of, of different modern multifamily buildings, you know, with various numbers of fixture supply units. And what you notice is that those black dots are well below that red line. In fact, if we take this cluster here and zoom in, what we'll notice is that as that as that hunter's curve value keeps climbing up and up and up and up, these dots basically remain flat, even though you're increasing the size of the building. If you were to actually calculate what those design values, what that difference is, we're looking at a safety factor of five to 27 times, uh, not percent, but times, uh, which is just really, really grossly over, overestimating a peak flow rate. Mr. Klein and 2050 partners uh, went ahead in their report, uh, which there's a QR code there and, and there's another QR code on the next page. They ended up using the water demand calculator, which is those blue dots there. And the blue dots, that you see there is what the water demand calculator estimates. And what you'll notice is that the water demand calculator dots are much closer to the actual black dots of what was actual measured peak flow rates. Again, the water demand calculator has a safety factor in it. And this is important because a lot of engineers, you know, when you talk about right sizing, like, well, I don't want to undersize my pipes. Clearly based on the data from the water demand calculator, you still are going to have a safety factor in the range of two to six times. So we made a huge step sometimes in terms of an order of, of magnitude of five to six X reduction in terms of a 27 to, um, uh, you know, like five uh, or four X um, uh, peak flow rate estimation. And again, peak flow rate and available pressure are the two main criteria that are used to size a pipe. So again, if you want a copy of this, this QR code will take you to, to the webpage where you can download the full report to look into it. But again, by more accurately estimating the peak flow rate, you're going to end up with a reduction in pipe size, meter size, and everything else. So the benefits of that lead to a number of things. First off is construction cost savings. Um, and there's two main reports on the IATMA webpage uh, for the water demand calculator. It's that same webpage that I pointed to you, you all to before. Um, one was commissioned by Stant, uh, commissioned by Atmo by Stant, uh, to have Stantec do a review. The other one was uh, completed by the Alliance for Water Efficiency that looks at connection fees and service charges based on meter size reductions. Focusing on that, that latter one first, here's an example of one of the charts that came from the Alliance for Water Efficiency report and just reducing the water meter size one nominal pipe size. So for instance, if you went from a one inch meter to a three quarter inch meter, the savings and connection fee, the average was somewhere in the range of almost $2,000. And in many places in the US, which base the water rates and sewer rates based on the water meter size, the savings for water savings, and this does not include um, the sewer savings was somewhere about a hundred, um, let me see here, about $100 a year. So again, you're, you're, you're looking at some potential savings and operating improvements that are, are more due to more efficiency. The Stantec report conversely looked at different markets in the US. So uh, basically high labor rate to low labor rate and, and different unit sizes to compare the potential in terms of construction cost savings, which were somewhere in the range, um, as you can see here, anywhere from a couple percent all the way up to 11 or even 16% in certain markets. This is now th what's worth noting in this is this was all utilizing pre pandemic and pre supply chain issue. RS means data. So some of these numbers could actually be even higher now in terms of the potential construction cost savings for single and multifamily applications. And if you combine all those values, what you'll find is that especially in a large high unit, you know, high rise uh, or large apartment complex, like 200 units, savings could be in the quarter million to millions of dollar ranges. So again, really important to, to, to realize that there are opportunities here for construction cost savings uh, throughout um, the use of this, which is a key metric because often sustainability initiatives have a cost benefit analysis because they cost more. Ours, uh, we break that calculation because with the water demand calculator, it costs less right off the bat. 
And in terms of acceptance, the water demand calculator does continue to improve in acceptance. Um, again, going back to that water meter point, there was a, a report done by the Water Research Foundation assessing water demand patterns to improve sizing of water meters and service lines. And again, um, uh, what that document, along with AWWA M22, uh, the fourth edition that just came out uh, back in August of this year, both of them seem to uh, both of them clearly indicate that right sizing through the water demand calculator is an important portion of, of, of making sure your system maintains efficiency and also not losing revenue, uh, as mentioned before with the right size meter. So right size meters along with the water demand calculator is a real sweet spot. Um, and that's gonna be a very, very high performing system. And with the water demand calculator, more um, likely what would happen is more water meter types are gonna become available um, because your initial water peak flow rate is going to be much reduced compared to a, um, uh, a hunter's curve size meter. And that's part of the reason why AWWA, completely independently from IATMO, indicated that the water demand calculator is a recommended method for estimating peak water demand in residential buildings. Going back to that 200 unit apartment complex I showed before, you know, you might have a, a, a four inch, 250, you know, GPM peak flow rate, you know, might have maybe a three inch meter of some kind. With the water demand calculator, um, you might end up depending on available pressure somewhere around two inches, which means that maybe a one and a half inch or even one inch or one and a quarter inch meter may be sufficient for that building, which means your minimum flow rate with a turbine meter, for instance, may go from, let's say, you know, two to five GPM all the way down to, uh, you know, one or even half GPM. So a, a great, uh, much better ability um, to, to capture low flow rates, which often occur. Just to kind of close the loop on that part of the conversation, um, the this is an example again of a one and a half and two inch meter. So again, you notice the difference of a minimum flow rate uh, for these turbine meters of one and a quarter GPM and one and a half. Again, this is just an example, it's not an endorsement. If you look at the data from the water demand calculator, you notice there's a peak hour, but oftentimes that, that especially in many places that this, this um, flow rate bounces along the bottom for an individual home or unit. And recently, as part of our some of our, our future efforts for the water demand calculator, and, and I'll, I'll close the loop on this at, towards the end of that of the presentation, I actually installed a meter on my 18-unit condo complex, which I live in. Uh, we did a 30-day study, and as you can see, for much of the time, that water flow rate bumped along the bottom. Um, you know, the peak flow rate, again, it went from 153 down to about 70 GPM with uh, the water demand calculator estimation. Uh, and that, that in part was mostly due to the irrigation and pool flow being so high. Uh, the water demand calculator, the, the, the calculation went from 100 GPM down to 18 for the 18 units. And when you put into buckets the various uh, time frames or the amount of time that the the units were, or that the, the flow rates were occurring, if you'll notice from zero to one and a half GPM, that was almost 60 to 70% of the time that the, that the, that the, of the flow rates that were measured. So again, there could be a lot of missed revenue, you know, again, going over the one and a half to, to 10 GPM made much, much less um, of that, of that total time frame. So not just at the water meter and the water service entrance um, and, and some of the overall pipe sizing, but here's an example. This is from my colleague, Randy Lorge, um, who is a training instructor uh, and, and helps our training credentialing department is one of the, the directors over there. He presented at the IATMO conference in San Antonio, and that's the QR code if you want to watch his full one hour presentation. But he did the six unit apartment complex. And, and what you can see here is utilizing the method in chapter six and appendix A, which are based on the hunter's curve. Going to the water demand calculator, you'll notice that the pipe size reductions, for instance, then the incoming water main go down to an inch. A lot of the other pipe sizes are reduced. And then again, the, the line to and from the water heater goes from a one and a quarter inch down to one inch. Uh, and some of the subsequent water heater sizes are also reduced. This is important because especially when you reduce the some of the hot water lines, there are a lot of opportunities for water and sustainability and, and energy reduction. Uh, on our webpage, on that water demand calculator webpage, there's another uh, subpage uh, under resources. Um, and again, here's the QR code and the link that links to, uh, uh, right now we have a list of about 24 peer reviewed studies that touch on the topic of right sizing, such as through the water demand calculator, leading to water and energy savings. And this is really one of the big things where when the water demand calculator is utilized and adopted, 
achieving water savings is as easy as turning on your faucet. And, and the reason for this is actually one of the studies uh, that uh, that talked about this was the Lutz shower curve. Uh, Jim Lutz, uh, who was a researcher with the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in, in Northern California, he did this shower curve study that discussed structural water and energy savings, uh, or excuse me, structural behavioral waste. For instance, this morning, I'm assuming we all showered at home. When you turned on your shower, the shower, you know, most of us probably didn't jump into the shower right away. We waited for that cold water or the hot water, which has cooled off overnight to be displaced by hot water from the water heater. This is that structural water waste that we're talking about. Then it reaches a temperature that's good for bathing, but we don't jump right in right away because that water hasn't quite reached, uh, we, you know, we're just due to waste, we're brushing our teeth or something else. So there's a behavioral waste component too. There's another IGC uh, within, we, I think it's within WeStand that touches on this, but specifically the water demand calculator can help address this. Interesting to note, uh, some anecdotal information, uh, like I mentioned before, that building official uh, that I presented to who her shower was right next to the water heater. She lived in homes before that she would have to turn on the shower and wait for a time before she jumped in. Her behavior modified because human beings were very adaptable and she realized that the water turns on right away and she wants to be, you know, even though she doesn't necessarily specialize in water conservation per se, she does, many of us try to be water conscious. And so her behavior changed where now she turns on the shower and goes in right away. She doesn't turn it on and wait for that water to, to that structural waste to occur. So one of the, th the, 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 the things that we think is, especially that hot water ratio and the water demand calculator is a really great pairing to help per, per reduce the overall structural water waste. We've done some studies. Uh, again, IATMO, we commissioned ARIP, um, and in that main water demand calculator webpage, not the resources tab, but, but the main page before, there was a report done by ARIP, and uh, they looked at a few different layouts, um, a, a single family, six unit, and a 45 unit. And then separately, there was a report done by TRC and Frontier Energy for the California Energy Commission. And they looked at several other ones, and which, uh, several other um building configurations. And what you're seeing is right now an, um, 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 an average value of about 500 gallons per dwelling unit per year. So, uh, you know, just to give you an idea, just by right-sizing the, the water system from the water demand calculator, a home or a dwelling unit, an apartment could see the, the, the waiting time for hot water reduced that could lead to water savings that equal an outdoor hot tub every year. So when we're talking about Acre feet, you know, it, it's not going to solve the water crisis by itself. You know, one acre foot in the U.S. equals 326,000 gallons of water. So you're needing this for, for many, many homes, but it's going to be part of that water efficiency portfolio of solutions. Now, worth noting, I know there's this one anomaly here, but it's worth including the Air 45 unit where the kitchen sink was the furthest one. And this is another area of, of, of potential research opportunity out there. So the showers tended to have one usage per day. Uh, that where you had to lead, to, which led to that water waste. And, and it was one shower per day because the assumption was if you had like a, a, a two people living in a home or a dwelling unit, one person would shower followed by the other person. But in a kitchen sink, you might, especially if somebody's working from home, you might have multiple uses, you know, during the day where that person, especially if they're going to get the dishwasher running or if they're trying to rinse protein, like egg off of a plate, um, that, that takes, you know, that, that they might be waiting longer. Again, we use hot water for washing protein. I used to do healthcare facility engineering and, and hot water is really desired because protein tends to get washed off of utensils and plates at higher water temperatures under greater pressure and greater flow rates uh, for longer durations of time. So temperature is one of those key components. So when we, if you, depending on which fixture is the furthest one away, that can have an impact is what we're, we're thinking here um, in terms of potential water savings as well. So again, this is giving us some rough idea in terms of some of the potential in terms of water saving criteria. So in summary, you know, the benefits of right sizing through the water demand calculator include construction cost savings, faster delivery time of hot water, water and embedded energy savings. Um, you know, especially the, the, the smaller pipe sizing for hot water will also lead to less heat dissipation. Some of the basic mechanical engineering courses in terms of heat and mass transfer, a larger pipe, has a greater surface area and dissipates more heat. Smaller pipe, smaller surface area dissipates less heat. So less heat will be required there. Um, you know, and, and also the, the, the reduced public health and safety risk, you know, again, improving public health and safety, uh, improving water quality due to the shorter water dwell times in the premise plumbing system. So going back to that water resiliency, plumbing resiliency framework, 
you know, we're doing at least three of the things really well. And again, a hurricane and earthquake is kind of a, a, an, an ancillary sidebar thing that doesn't isn't really affected by this. So again, it's positive in three, neutral on another. That's just a great example of a plumbing resilient solution, which is really why it is in the we stand. And again, there's the link to all the reports that I mentioned before, a nice summary. So in conclusion, there's two things I want you all to take away from this is one, the we stand offers many water conservation benefits while maintaining water safety. So it is, it's part of that plumbing resilient framework, that water resilient framework. And finally, the water demand calculator is a revolutionary tool within we stand that updates an almost 90 year old flow rate estimation methodology. Uh, it reduces construction costs, improve water and energy efficiency, and potentially improves water quality by lowering the water age. Uh, with that, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take questions or, or just provide some additional conversation on a few items. Uh, worth noting those final two QR codes. Uh, I do have a newsletter on LinkedIn uh, called Plumbing Science, where I touch on this and many other subjects. And then I am also the producer and host of IATMO's Authority Podcast, Plumbing and Mechanical, where we have had folks on like Jim Lutz and Gary Klein and Dan Cole um, and, and um, um, many others on these sorts of topics. So uh, if you're looking for more resources, I would love to have you all connect with me that way and then listen in and, and get your feedback. Honestly, the biggest part is, is that back and forth dialogue. Uh, there's my email address and phone number as well, my direct line. So uh, at that point, I, I think we can open it up for con further conversation and questions. Thank you, Christoph. That was incredible. Um, I just have to say, I'm uh, I was shocked by that the uh, the hunter's curve. Um, wow, the basis of all the plumbing assumptions for so long, um, and yeah, it's incredible that I mean. I'm sure that at the time that was far ahead of what um, anyone had available, uh, but that it took this long for someone to revisit it at scale is really incredible. Yep. Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to just invite um, Natalie. I see you've uh, put a chat in. Would you, I could just give you um, here. I can, there, you should be able to unmute your mic now, if you'd like to just ask directly. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, this was very insightful. I really loved your presentation, Christoph. I I put the question in the chat box, but it's basically, uh, I want to know if there is any active collaboration between, between the IAPMO and other international standards organizations. Uh, I know that here in, in Canada, uh, there is the, the CSA group, the association, there is also UL, I don't remember, UL standards and engagement, I think it's called. So I would like to know if there is any ongoing work or collaboration to uh, harmonize these water demand practices globally. Yes, um, and definitely happy to speak on that, uh, Natalia. Uh, so first off, um, IATMO, you know, we are a World Plumbing Council organization. Uh, you know, we're, we're actually one of the, the leading institutions there and, and help provide a lot of the resources behind that. Um, as mentioned, we presented at the CIB conference, which is an international uh, research uh, component. And, and Toju Omogomi, my other colleague, uh, who used to work with the University of Cincinnati, was part of the original task force um, that created the water demand calculator. She now has joined IATMO, and we're, we're really appreciative of her talent and efforts and, and time being a part of IATMO. She presented on the water demand calculator and data collection for commercial buildings, which is actually we're now taking it, uh, taking the water demand calculator and trying to apply it to commercial buildings, too. And, and so we're in process of collecting data from commercial buildings. So she presented uh, at that particular conference and, and we've been presenting there. Uh, Dan Cole presented there, I think, in 2018 and 2019 as well, if I remember the years correctly on the water demand calculator. Um, that led to like Australia standards um, developing their version of the water demand calculator uh, or are in process of it. And, um, you know, as mentioned before by Adam, you know, we've been in contact with Vancouver, uh, the city of Vancouver adopted the water demand calculator originally to right size the non potable water systems stemming from stormwater collection, uh, feeding, um, feeding toilets, uh, water closets in, in the buildings. So uh, for flushing of those toilets from the speed of the stormwater. So that was what was utilized. They since have adopted it as part of overall, which is really the Pacific Northwest is probably the most progressive part of the, of the North America right now. Um, Seattle uh, was one of the early adopters. They're actually looking at mandating the water demand calculator. 
And and Portland is in Portland Water Department. We've just been in conversations with them because they want to right size all their meters this way. Um, so that kind of gives you a flavor of, of who we're working with right now. Uh, yes, we're talking to CSA. Um, um, we're also um, uh, the water demand calculator is also in process of becoming uh, an IATMO ANSI Canada standard. Um, so I, I believe that work is has started. So um, you know this especially the water demand calculator, there's a lot of great opportunities and, and we are making inroads. Um, and again, there's examples of Vancouver that have already adopted it. Um, I know that there's some engineers um, that I've talked to in other parts of Canada that have utilized the water demand calculator on their projects and have, have um, used it as a, um, a code modification uh, with, with their AHJs to allow the usage. So um, you know, it's definitely a, a, a bit on the early phases, but I, I do sense Natalia that that one is likely going to continue to, um, the, the usage and, 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 and development that we've started is going to just continue. Uh, and I, I just feel fortunate to be part of it. You know, again, much of this work on the residential side was before I joined IATMO. Much of my efforts now are focused on taking it into commercial spaces, such as hotels, healthcare facilities, um, uh, retail facilities, offices, schools, universities, um, and we're really starting to do a, a really good job of getting a lot of data from those spaces. So over the next several years, I'm very excited to see what the, the future progress will hold. Um, and, and our task group, uh, the task force was expanded to a task group. So we went from about five members that included the American Society of Plumbing Engineers, University of Cincinnati, and IATMO to a task group now that has over 50 volunteers. We're working with Fortune 500 companies, um, a lot of large plumbing manufacturers. Um, we really have a wonderful group of collaborators and stakeholders that are now putting a lot of effort into this. And some of those are in Canada too. So does that answer your question, Natalie? Uh, does that give you kind of a good overview of what we're working on both on the domestic, uh, US domestic and international you know, Canada side? Yes, thank you so much. I am very happy to hear that uh, Northwest is leading the way in North America. And also I'm very happy to hear about the collaboration with CSA. Uh, so it's, it's uh, great to have the opportunities for Canada to lead in this sustainable water management. And uh, cities like Vancouver that can be part of the progress and like be a, a model for other cities as well. So thank you so much for your answer. Uh, definitely happy, uh, Natalie, um, or Natalia, excuse me. Um, you know, worth mentioning on that podcast, we actually did have uh, Chris Radzaminski and Philip White, I believe, on one of our episodes to talk about Vancouver's use of the water demand calculator. Um, so that's one of our episodes. I can't remember from what season. We're, we're finishing up season four right now. Um, but uh, both of them were on there and, and had a really wonderful conversation with them about it. So, um, you know, again, another another great resource over there is that podcast. You can listen in and kind of hear some of the context behind uh, right right from them, right from as far as that they're them looking at it. Absolutely. And thank so, you very much. Christoph, the podcast, we can find that through your LinkedIn. Is that the easiest way? Um, so we actually have a dedicated web page. Um, oh, I was going to okay. say, I think I updated the QR codes. I think everything sw just switched up. Um, if not, um, I can pull it up and I can drop that link in the chat. Um, but yeah, it, uh, okay, we have sure. a full web page for that. And you can also look it up on most of your podcast apps. We also have a YouTube channel that um, uh, that also has the um uh that has now we started this season with audio and video uh, uh -huh. recordings. so um you can watch it either way excellent so we'll i'll put that at... in the chat those qr codes might that, that one qr code might be broken i just realized that just now so well for my purposes my phone is always over in the window somewhere to get the best signal so i'm all <laughs> i can never use the <laughs> qr code so I just put uh, the I just put in the chat the uh the authority podcast link. So excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that is a great resource. Um this you are a font of information. This has been great. Um I see it's 204. Um I wonder if you have maybe a, if there's any other questions, if you have another minute or two you could spare. Yeah, definitely. Um anyone else have any questions for Christoph? All right. Uh, I actually have just one. It maybe it seems like a um, a confusing technical question, for, but it seems to come up a lot lately with um, the multi-unit residential buildings. There's a sort of counter counteracting trends about submetering, and one of those is with water. As municipalities start charging more for water, um, the building owners are starting to at least 
look at sub-metering water to understand where there are leaks and be able to manage it because uh, mm -hmm. they found, you know, it would take them, you know, as much as a year to find a leaky toilet because mm -hmm. they couldn't identify which unit it was coming from. And I'm wondering it, if I understood it correctly, there's lots of guidance about that, but I maybe got lost in the details about the metering sizing, the sort of bulk meter sizing, and I wonder how it could guide sub-metering water as well. So, so that's a great question, Adam. And one of the things worth noting is that if you start going to sub-metering, it can, it has the potential to actually increase the amount of piping and, and, and whatnot in your system. Uh, especially in high rise, we tend to like vertical distribution uh, from an engineering standpoint, because you can have the pipes right behind the, the, um, the stacked fixtures from floor to floor. Um, so from a bulk system, uh, particularly that chapter four, I think it was uh, that I mentioned, what it's almost going to drive towards is an ultrasonic flow meter, which is becoming like, like many of the manufacturers are, are producing these. And, and those ultrasonic flow meters have low, very, very low peak flow rates. Uh, so 0.25 is pretty easily achieved. I was just looking at like a, a one inch ultrasonic flow meter, and we're talking a fraction of, uh, of that uh, is the minimum flow rate for an ultrasonic flow meter. So um, that technology is getting out there. I also think, though, from a submetering standpoint, again, pointing back to um, that that IATMO standard uh, that I discussed in terms of leak detection, um, that standard was uh, IATMO Z1349, which is the devices for the detection, monitoring, and control of plumbing systems. My sense is, and if I recall correctly, that, that some of those devices have the ability to use sound waves in the system to determine which fixtures are on and, and collect that data for metering too. So some of the traditional ideas we have behind metering in terms of, oh, you have to have a meter into a unit and all the rest, that paradigm is one that's also, again, plumbing is amazing, is, is that might be shifting because you may not need that. You might be able to have a stack of, uh, you know, from unit to unit to unit, six units, you know, stacked for each of them having a kitchen sink. And you may be able to put one of those devices down on you know, the base of that stack and you can calibrate it so you know which unit's coming in and feed it into a building management system and it can generate and, and track what each of those usages, usages are and assign that to the unit that's in there. So some of this sub-metering may end up shifting over the years um, because of some of the technologies that are coming out. So, you know, again, the building meter, um, that chapter four, especially having one that has a lower floor is certainly part of that. Submetering is part of that solution. And, and this is where the WeStand is such a wonderful standard because it's really the, 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 the hotbed, that, that proving ground of, you know, you have an ANSI, um, an ANSI accredited process that gets a balanced body that's considering these items with that lens of, of sustainability while maintaining safety. So does that answer the question a little bit for you, Adam? Absolutely. Yeah, that is incredible. Um, uh, that is the perfect, perfect response. I now understand I, you're exactly, exactly the thing that you find often with, uh, as we're exploring this sort of cutting edge um, sustainability topics is it often involves a little bit of a, a paradigm shift, a little bit of a rethinking of where you're standing to kind of, you know, you can't get there from here. Um, and I really appreciated also your the um, part about the residential sizing. The I, it had never occurred to me to think of water demand and water use in the context of floor space, and it's such an interesting shift in design thinking. Yes, to just just look at the plan and see how much of that space is being used. Where's the water going? And if you can shrink the surface air, the floor space that contains water, that means you're being more efficient with your water. It's such a, it makes absolute sense, but it would, I can't imagine I would have gotten there on my own. So that was, yeah, really interesting. Yeah. That one, I, again, much credit to Gary Klein. Uh, he is a very much a revolutionary thinker when it comes to energy conservation and really has developed himself to, to being a, 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 somebody that considers the Legionella side and waterborne pathogen and safety. And, and that topic, when you introduced it to me, uh, it, 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 like you said, it shows the importance there, but it also shows um, the need for the plumbing design professional to coordinate with the architect, because that particular topic is much more dictated by the architect than it is an engineer. And Absolutely. so it really starts to to bring in more holistic thinking and that, that showing the necessity of that in terms of design and construction. Right.
Amazing. I love it. This has been a really, really eye-opening presentation. I really appreciate you taking the time to share it with us today. Um, I think we'll have to wrap here. Uh, but thank you again, Christoph. This has been great. I really look forward to um, connecting with you and seeing all of the other resources that you're generating. Um, yeah, this has really unlocked a, a new world of water efficiency for us. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time today. Happy to be here. And thanks again for the opportunity, Adam. Thank you all. Oh, pleasure. We'll be in touch soon. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, and uh, for anyone who's watching the video, please uh, connect with Christoph um, on LinkedIn, join his podcast, follow him everywhere, YouTube as well. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye.